I'm happy to be here today. And what I'm, my KT Challenge program is all about food, and it's all about our cultural biases surrounding food. What do we think is acceptable food? What do we think is abhorrent to eat? And why? What is at the basis of what we choose to eat and what we consider acceptable? Specifically, I'm going to be talking about eating insects, which is technically called entomophagy. Entomophagy is derived from entomo, meaning insect, and phagy, meaning eat, to eat insects. Mm. <laughs> and it's actually very common worldwide to find cultures all over the world that eat insects as a regular part of their diet. In fact, it's Western cultures where we consider eating insects abhorrent or disgusting or just bizarre. But really, throughout the world, it's not considered that way. Insects, these kinds of views in, in local markets are very common. So insects are commonly sold in local markets as food sources for consumption. So where do our cultural biases, where do, our, where do we get our ideas of what's good, what's bad, what's palatable, what's not palatable? And I would argue that it's based partly on what our family eats, so family biases. It's based partly on what our friends, our cultural groups eat. And it's based also on religious beliefs. So there's certainly certain foods that religious, uh, different religious uh, um, cultures consider as taboo, as not acceptable to eat. But that doesn't mean that they're not edible foods. So to really drive home this message that cultural biases are what really determine what we choose to eat, what we consider as acceptable foods, let me do a little survey, take a little survey. Raise your hands, all of you, raise your hands. How many of you have eaten bees? Raise your hands high. Oh, there actually are some people who have eaten bees. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> but the majority of you have not eaten bees, yet bees are considered a cultural delicacy in some parts of the world. So in Vietnam, they often serve fried bee pupae. Now let's switch that. Tell me how many of you, raise your hands if you've ever eaten bee vomit, bee barf. Raise, yes, because what do we call bee barf? Honey. That's how bees make honey is they regurgitate into the cells and they use the honey to feed the larvae. So we consider honey, bee barf, bee vomit, to be a delicacy. And yet some cultures would consider that abhorrent. That's just disgusting to eat bee vomit, and yet the bees themselves are considered a delicacy. It's all about what we learn is good, is bad, is acceptable, is not acceptable. The animals that we choose to use as protein sources in Western countries are really pretty limited. So what we choose as protein sources are largely mammals, domesticated mammals like cows, goats, sheep, chickens, well, that's not a mammal, but birds as well, we'll eat, we'll eat fishes, we'll eat different kinds of seafood. But it's really pretty limited what we consider as a protein source in our diet. We also will oftentimes eat insects, close relatives, close cousins, lobsters and crabs. We consider these delicacies. Yet lobsters and crabs are essentially first cousins to insects. They're all in the phylum arthropoda. Arthropods are anything with an outer exoskeleton and jointed legs, so arthropods include crabs, they include insects, spiders, millipedes, centipedes. We'll eat crabs, no problem. Lobsters, blue crab, mm -mm -mm. But we would consider it just bizarre to include insects on our dinner plate or spiders on our dinner plate. There's a nice spider right there. Yet insects are an incredibly nutritious food item. They're high in protein, low in fat. If you're trying to lose weight, I'd argue an insect diet might be the way to go. <laughs> they are very efficient at converting plant stuffs into protein. So insects and fish actually convert feed, plant material or other kinds of feed into body mass, into protein, much more efficiently than mammals and birds do. And they require very little space to raise insects for our diet. So it's the next frontier of culturally sensitive and ecologically worthy uh, animal protein is raising insects. 
So in my KT Challenge program, I'll give an expanded version of this talk. I'll talk about entomophagy, and I'll talk about how cultures worldwide use and include insects in their diet. For example, in Africa, some tribes will own termite mounds because that termite mound is a rich source of protein. They eat the termites, and they will eventually harvest the queen. That's the queen, this big sausage thing. Huge animal, about this big, very, very rich in energy. In Australia, the Aborigines will pick apart the nests of honeypot ants. Honeypot ants they have repletes, they have worker ants. These worker ants with the big abdomens are called repletes. And the repletes will eat plant material, they'll eat nectar, and they, can, they store it in their abdomens as a sugary substance. So the Aborigines will break into the mounds of the honeypot ants, they take the repletes, and they just bite off the abdomens like nature's candy. I'll also talk about the different sources of information that are available that, that teach us about how different cultures from thousands of years ago to the present use insects in the diet. This is from my collection of books, small collection that I have, and it includes a couple of different cookbooks, but it includes a lot of different sources of information that are out there about entomophagy. And how many of you got to taste the, the tidbits that I had outside? If you didn't have a chance, they're on a table outside. I brought some of these chocolate chirpy chip cookies and some, oops, and some chirpy, uh, chirpy chips. These are both made, the cookies and the chips are made from cricket flour. And there's actually a company that you can get cricket flour and these items from. So in my KT Challenge program, I'll have some items that people can taste. And then we'll end the evening with a trip over to Linger's Restaurant. Linger's is the converted, uh, used to be Olinger's Mortuary, so they took off the O and they made it into Linger's Eateries. And Linger's is known for providing and for offering different really interesting dishes, including cricket tacos. So we'll end the, the evening over in Linger's after my lecture uh, with a dinner of cricket tacos. Should I uh, be awarded the KT Challenge, it will be used to support a meeting I'm hosting, a scientific conference. July 2nd to the 9th, I'm hosting the International Congress of Arachnology. It's being held in Golden. It's co-hosted by the museum and by the American Arachnological Society and the International Society of Arachnology. This meeting is held every three years. And this year, this is an old slide I made two days ago. I had 325 people attending. Now it's up to 350. It's going to be the largest gathering of people in my field ever. So the lar it's kind of scary to think about the largest gathering of arachnologists. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's going to be the largest gathering of arachnologists ever held in the world. Uh, and it has uh, representatives, attendees from 37 different countries coming. Those 37 different countries, about half of them, about 49% of them, are U United Nations designated developing countries, struggling co countries. <clears throat> so uh, attending a scientific conference like this is an incredible opportunity for scientists. It provides not only an opportunity to share their research, share their most recent findings, but also to network with colleagues. And that networking opportunity is critically important, particularly for students, particularly from people from developing countries. It also provides an opportunity to establish, establish new collaborations with scientists for new future projects. And job opportunities, it's critical for that. There's a glut of PhDs in my field. And without that personal, meeting, that networking opportunity, you're just not going to be competitive for a job. So networking at meetings oftentimes is a, is a career maker, particularly for students. And in underdeveloped countries, you really can't, uh, I can't understate the importance of attending these conferences. Such conferences are really are critical for career development and for taking the next step. A lot of these scientists who are going to be attending the meeting, they simply don't have a network of people to, to interact with. Getting resources is difficult, so attending the conference is really going to be an incredible opportunity for them. Between the museum and the American Arachnological Society and the International Society of Arachnology, those three groups provided 26,000 
dollars to support the attendees of this meeting. We were able to use that money to support 54 people, but we had an overwhelming response to, to our offer to the travel grants, and we couldn't support all the people that applied to the travel grants. So I'm hoping to use the KT Challenge money to supplement this, to bring in even more people from developing countries. Of those 54 people that we were able to support using these various funds of money, 69% of them are people, students and non-students from developing nations. So the KT Challenge money, will be able to, we'll, I'll use that to support attendance by students and colleagues, for example, from India, Nigeria, Hungary, Sri Lanka, Czech Republic, Mexico, Colombia, just as an example of some of the people who have requested funding who simply wouldn't be able to attend unless I can get some additional resources. So I encourage you to grab some grub and support some scientists in need. Thank you very much.